Hello. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> it's lovely. Right, I'm going to play with flicking my glasses on and off because I can see you without them on, but I can't see my notes with them off. So, <laughs> bear with. Okay, so I'm from the UK, and British witchcraft exists in two forms. Well, three probably. Magicians and occultists, Wiccans and witches. Now, a lot of the UK occultists and Luciferian Satanists will still tell you that they practice witchcraft. So whether or not witchcraft is a very British thing to do, I'm sure it's not. Right? <laughs> um, we heard yesterday from David Beth, he said like, that magic is defined as you know, the manipulation of natural and supernatural forces in accordance with your will. I don't care what your will is. Okay, I care not whether you practice light, nice, white witchcraft as they discuss in Wiccan circles. And I don't care if you practice like Shay's violent divine and everything is destructive. With purpose, obviously. Neo-paganism, that's a... But I think that's quite a British thing, isn't it, as well? And the funny thing with that is neo-pagans just mean they're modern. And they hate it. And they sit there and they say, but I practice the old ways. Okay, does anyone know what the old ways are? <laughs> right, and they tell me this when they're on a laptop. And you're like, yeah, right. <laughs> I practice new ways, okay? I write on my laptop. I travel on aircraft to get to events like this. And so on, you know, new, like it. 21st century was made for me. Right. So how old are the rituals that we practice and how old is the magic we use? Well, the earliest evidence dates back to the Middle Paleolithic. So the first evidence of ritual was 300,000 years ago, which I think is phenomenal. And it came in the form of funerary rites. So it's the things they find in ancient graves. Now... I'm just going to go out on a limb here and assume that if man was doing rituals for passing from this life to the next, in whatever form they believed that to take, I'm going to assume they did rituals to mark births and possibly other rites of passage, which I think is why we do now. That's kind of stayed inherent in us. So we still celebrate weddings. We still They are rituals in themselves. Okay, the earliest documented evidence of magic performed. Now, I really like this because this ties in with the whole questions they had yesterday about science and magic. So, the earliest documented magic, which is questionable whether it's actually accurate or not, or really happened, but it was allegedly performed by a magician called Dedi during the reign of the fourth dynasty of the pharaoh Khufu. So, it's ancient Egyptian, and this particular magic trick involved cutting the head off a chicken, right? But watching that chicken still run round. Now, we know today about the nerves and science that's involved in that. But of course, back then, to watch somebody do that, their knowledge, they had mastered death. That was really important and significant. So, you know, it could be understood by his audience that whether he understood the science for whatever it was worth to him or whether he viewed it as magic to his audience he had dominion over death and that was a massive trick right um the earliest known written incantations they come from the city of uruk in iraq or mesopotamia and they were inscribed on cuneiform clay tablets around the fifth and fourth centuries bce so we've been writing spells since way back. It's not new. So we can, say, we can see that magic itself is pretty old. But what about the techniques we use today? So how many of you are familiar with totemism? Yeah, and the concept of totem animals, power animals, that sort of thing. Right, totemism, fabulous. Everyone knows it, everyone understands what it is. Right, it's completely wrong, okay? It actually comes from the Ojibwe word, a totemon, and it originally meant the relationship between brothers and sisters 
of blood brothers and sisters, meaning they couldn't marry. So effectively, this totemism was about you not being able to marry your brother or sister. So how does it end up as a power animal? Good question. Right, <laughs> well, what you do is you get a translator and a merchant to come back to the UK with this word, clearly not the world's best translator, you realise, and says he believes it comes from meaning, the Ojibwe word for meaning guardian spirit. It didn't, but he believed it did. So he introduces that to the ever, ever gullible British public <laughs> and they tell everybody else. And there you have it. So he believed this because the Ojibwe, like a lot of Native Americans, wore animal skins and the remnants of dead animals. Now, you can look me up online and you can see that I ran an organisation with Talit Jameson called Clan Dolman. And you will see lots of us running around with furs and antlers and, and things. Right? And basically it's about working with your ancestors or working between the realms. So to put on something that is a remnant of death, you may want to take on the attributes of that animal you can see why the Ojibwe would think, oh yeah, I'll have the, the cunning of a wolf or the strength of a bear or the speed of a gazelle or whatever, you know, power of a buffalo. So this is where it comes from. So it's a complete mistranslation, but today it has come to mean power animal. Okay, fetishism. Who practices this? That's like the idea that something inanimate or created, whether from nature or man-made, has power. Now, I think this is probably, this was real David Beth territory with Haitian voodoo and Hollywood, you know, because what comes into that, of course, is the concept of voodoo dolls. They are created and they are imbued with power and they have a magical spirit that works on its own accord, right? We also have a thing called poppets in the UK and poppets are probably as old as Haitian voodoo dolls they're very very um, way back Anglo-Saxon magic I use them in um, I wrote a story about where I live because it's a very strange place and I use poppets in that with the witch because it's a very very British thing to do and the idea of a poppet is that you can use it, if you can use it to cure, you can use it to curse. Whatever it is in magic, if you can use it to cure, you can use it to curse. So poppets are similar. We use them, they're little dolls with usually a pouch in the front where you can put coins, crystals, if you're trying to get money. You can draw a face on it to mask the person that you're trying to cure or kill, whatever you're trying to do. Like I said, I don't care what you do. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, so they are a really familiar thing. African fetishes, the wooden dolls, some of those. Um, I don't know if anybody saw a film years ago where this African doll came to life. A bit like Chucky, but probably more disturbing, to be honest. Right, um, what else have we got? Oh, vision quests. Vision quests, meditation, journeying. Yeah, loads of you have done that, right? Um, th those who came to the ritual last night, everyone more or less said, yeah, we've done Kundalini fire steak stuff. We've done communion. So, yeah, really common. Okay. That was first found in the Hindu Vedas. That's not a surprise, really, is it? That it came from the Hinduism, right? And that was from the 5th or 6th centuries BCE. It was designed then and now to create an altered state of consciousness. Divination. Divination, right? Everybody practices divination on some form, right? Or you go to somebody who does. Okay, right, in which case, tarot cards, I think, most comprehensive form of divination. And as somebody is talking this week, really, really pleased about this, they are not just for that, <laughs> right? Um, what about Ouija boards? 
<laughs> they weren't, honestly, right, I used to work in a witchcraft shop in the UK, right? <laughs> and somebody actually came in. We used to sell Ouija boards, and we used to take them in and resell them. So we'd sell second-hand ones that they'd conjured up who knows what, right? <laughs> and they were even better. <laughs> but people used to come in and say, aren't those illegal? And you're like, All right, okay, so you've got a board with some numbers and letters on. <laughs> Is a tin of alphabet spaghetti illegal? <laughs> you know, it's just mystifying. And the first Ouija board I ever did was not a Ouija board, right? My gran had these lexicon cards, and I had this great idea with my friend that we'd get bits of paper, and we'd just literally put them in a circle with numbers and letters on and got a wine glass out of my mum's cabinet and sat in the bathroom when I was 11 doing this <laughs> to see what we could call up. Don't ask, I can't remember, <laughs> but... We tried it. Divination, obviously, um, certainly in the UK and I guess in other areas, the idea of pendulums, yeah? I know that people all, for years in the UK have done the whole wedding ring over the pregnant lady to decide whether it's boy or girl. And good luck with that these days. <laughs> right? That was really politically incorrect, I'm sorry. <laughs> Herbal magic, okay. All right, originally the use of herbs was medicinal. Now, if you're looking back to kind of Paracelsus times and Hermes Trismegistus and things like that, the fact that you know how to cure something is magical. Right, these days herb magic does not unless you're a natural medical herbalist or qualified herbalist, involve curing people. Okay, and we all know that belladonna's toxic, right? <laughs> okay, even though it was used in flying ointment in the UK for centuries, <laughs> along with hemlock. <laughs> oh, that's great, isn't it? Fly garak, anything you could put in there. But the main ingredient of flying ointment fat of an unbaptized baby boy. Don't get that often these days, but, you know, if you do, it makes great flying ointment. Right, so herbalism these days tends to be things where basil corresponds to love, Irish moss for money, you know, wormwood for getting off your face, no? <laughs> Salvia divinorum, things like that. So it's used kind of in a more benign way, I suppose, really. And I'm not sure how much faith I hold out in herb magic. I tend to think that really it's more to do with that person's power of their will. Because, you know, like, really, I'm not convinced that stirring basil into your stew is going to make the man of your dreams fall in love with you. Right, I haven't seen it happen yet. You know, I'm, I'm still waiting. You know, and Tom Hardy still hasn't knocked on my door, <laughs> no matter how much basil I use. <laughs> so, you know, don't be fooled. Crystal magic. Now, crystal magic is kind of interesting, all right, because apart from the obvious thing of scrying with crystal balls, who does crystal healing and crystal grids? Anybody? See, if I ask that in the UK, all these Wiccans go, I do. <laughs> and nobody does here. Right, crystals, we know that they absorb a certain amount of energy. They do have powers. Everyone knows that, I mean, if you don't know anything else about crystals, which is kind of like me, really, you know that clear quartz goes to for everything. And everyone says rose quartz is really good for attracting love. Still no Tom Hardy in my house, all right? <laughs> Doesn't matter what I do. Okay, candle magic. Who here has any, um, who works with the different color candles for different rituals? Yeah, yeah, some of you? Right, so you kind of, are you doing the same thing as they're doing back home, which is things like pink for love, green for money, blue for health, white and black for just about everything? Yellow for creativity, I think it is. Red is good for Miss Right now. Pink is good for Miss Right. That sort of thing. Right. Um, 
the other things, okay, the bits we really want, and I know I've got limited time, so I don't want to spend more time on the real good stuff, right? Blood magic. Okay, everybody here practices blood magic in some form, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> do you know what? And if you do that in the UK, they all walk out the door. <laughs> I kid you not, right? I did a talk on Lucifer, and it talked about blood magic. And the minute you got to, like, blood sacrifice, you know, a dozen people leave. And then when you bring up necromancy, another dozen go. <laughs> it's like, they're not at all squeamish at witch events in the UK, not at all. Right, blood magic, the significance of it. Right? This is where I have great fun in the UK because I can usually find a willing sort of volunteer that I can sacrifice out of the Wiccan community and demonstrate. But if you can imagine, and I'm sure you easily can because you're a far, far more enlightened audience than some of them over there. And I really shouldn't say that because I love the UK and I love the occultists in it. But man, so, some of the... Um, we, I don't know, do you guys have the saying about those who are quite fluffy? Yeah? Do you understand that? Yeah? The fluffy? Right, we have a lot of that in the UK. Okay? When we had the occult left-hand path consortium, I think there was them going, oh, I can't go to that. <laughs> so it was quite a thing that we actually got one of the speakers down who ran one of the Wiccan organisations. And he came in and he was really good about it. But he's a whole lot more enlightened than he'd let on. Right, blood magic. Imagine, like, when you're doing blood rituals, that you are actually giving back to the land, if nothing else, you know, something that has existed for all time. So when you looked at the concept of human sacrifice, which was during the matriarchal man's early years, when you had these priestly shamanic kings... Right? And they were like looking at sacrificing humans. That was the point. And the whole idea of sacrificing a virgin is again quite relevant. So when you're sacrificing somebody, you are bleeding into the land, into your mother goddess at that point in time. Everything that has ever existed in your bloodline and all the potential that could have existed. And when you consider that, it's absolutely massive. It, it's not as simple as just like bleeding for your deity. What you're actually doing is giving everything. Everything exists in your blood. Yeah, that fire that runs through your veins contains the beginning of time but it also contains the end. It also contains every generation. Now, me and she had this discussion last night about children. So every, I've got four, ki four kids, four grandchildren, right? So if you take my blood before I'd ever had those, that is at least eight people you've stopped bringing in, you know, coming into being, which is an immense thing to do. So to give your life for your goddess back then would have been such an honour. Hard to imagine, you know, that you'd queue up to volunteer to be sacrificed. But in a lot of cases, people were brought up with that in mind. That to die for their tribe and for their goddess was immense. So blood magic has a lot more significance these days Fortunately, we don't generally sacrifice humans. I think of a few I might consider, but <laughs> we don't. But animal sacrifice, particularly like with David Beth talking about it, it's not something that you do lightly. When you suspend yourself, it's not something you do because you thought, oh, I'm a bit bored right now. I'm just going like, to hang myself and you know, see how much blood pours out. and That'll be good. <laughs> That will relieve five minutes of boredom. I mean, you're not going to do that, obviously. And, you know, even if you're, even if it is so gentle that all you're doing is lancing your thumb to add money to, um, to add your blood to 
ink or to the land or to whatever you're doing, whatever ritual you're creating, even if it's just that, you are in an altered state of mind. It is not something you do in the same way as making a sandwich and watching telly. Your state of mind has changed. You've done this to change your state of mind. You know, when you look at things like the Muslims at Lahaj and how they kill the goat, I think it is, isn't it? A goat they chase down and they rip it to shreds. It's a complete frenzy. They are not, you know, that man last week was selling you peas at the corner shop. And this week he's ripping chunks out of a goat. So he's obviously not in the same state of mind he is nine till five. It doesn't work like that. So blood as magic is powerful. Your blood is powerful. People should never underestimate that. They, they think because people say, oh, you practice blood magic. Blood magic comes in all forms. It is not just human sacrifice. It is not just sacrificing animals. And it is not about like Hollywood with the whole open an entire vein and bleed all over everything. It is not always that about that. But it is about putting your power, your life force, your stamp into something. Um, okay. Where am I? All right. We'll get a bit more delicate for two minutes with things like not magic. Does anybody know about not magic? Not magic is, a, is a, probably a very, well, it's not only a British thing because they've got the, um, I think it's the Kipu knots, isn't it? They have in Peru or somewhere. But not magic was the idea of, oh, hang on. I don't know if I can do this with a microphone in my hand, but you're kind of like one knot for something, two knots for something else, three knots for something else. Four knots to seal it, yeah? That kind of idea? Right, that's a very British thing. They'll stick knots in anything, right? <laughs> they really will. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's kind of one of those really bizarre things that I'm not sure. Well, I don't really know where it came from. There's some evidence that it was used in ancient Egypt, some in Rome, and in Celtic um, communities, it was used for protection, knots for protection, knots for healing. And again, the Peruvian kipu knots, they appear to be recording life events, but they don't know how to translate them. Well, that's because they could only be translated by the person that did them. Because if you're practicing knot magic, that is a, that's really personal. It's like all magic, you know. I'm not going to be able to necessarily translate one of your grimoires or, you know, one of your rituals effectively unless you want me to, unless you let me in. So magic is very personal, always. Okay, sigil magic. Yeah, you all know that, yeah? You all make sigils, right, okay. Sigil magic and magic squares. They have been used since Neanderthal times. They are not as new as people like to think. They were used for amulets or charms or for conjuring angels or demons to do one's bidding, which I think you all know. Okay, um, elemental magic. Who does that? Yeah? Okay, there's two sides of elemental magic. There's the practice of working with aspects of the elements or the elemental spirits themselves for ritual purposes. So, okay, elemental magic can be as sort of, I want to say as gentle, but then that kind of depends how you do it. If you do it properly, it's never gentle, elemental magic. But something like calling in the quarters at a ritual, which pagans do left, right and centre, okay? They always call in the quarters. Okay, so that is, so for some of them, I've discovered... This is about like inviting those attributes from the elements. So you're inviting the passion of the fire. You're inviting the cleansing waters of whatever, you know, and so on into your ritual. That's what you're doing. For some, it's about wanting the protection of those elements. I mean, I, I wonder with, I, I do wonder at times with pagans when they say we want the protection of the elements. 
So you've met fire, water and air, right? <laughs> you know, you've been in a hurricane, yeah? <laughs> you want the protection of it. <laughs> okay, got you. <laughs> and for others, it's actually about working with undines, um, salamanders, whatever, yeah? Which is a little bit more kind of... Um, well, that'd be a bit too racy for Wiccans, you know. They're, they're busy still trying to be protected by an earthquake, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> can't ask too much. Right, chaos magic. Everybody, yeah? Yeah, okay. All right, that's a postmodern magical tradition. And, you know, you know full well, Peter J. Carroll and Austin Osmond Spare and all of that were involved in bringing it to light. Austin Osmond Spare is often kind of more credited than Peter J. Carroll, which is a bit of a shame, but, you know, such is. All right, mental magic. <laughs> I'd hate to think what mental magic would entail in some places, but mental magic, the power of your mind only. Now, that, that's quite a big deal as well, because actually trying to hold your focus, you know, <laughs> we... I don't know about you, your countries, I have no idea, Rob, but I just know that in Britain they have this really big thing about one minute silences for anything and everything, right, that occurs. All right, you know, oh, somebody's just died quick, have a minute silence. All right, have you ever tried to just keep your mind still for one minute? It's quite difficult. So when you're talking about mental magic, people are talking about keeping their minds still for hours at times. That's quite a big thing to do. So hats off to all those who can do it. But, you know, <laughs> the minute silence, I can't. <laughs> I can't do a minute silence, for goodness sake. Right. <laughs> okay, necromancy. Who practices necromancy? See, this is like, when, when I do this in the UK, right, and you say necromancy and they all leave the room, they, they assume that I'm sat in the graveyard, like, digging people up and, you know, like, creating voodoo dolls and getting these zombies to walk across the <laughs> Portland to do something or other. I don't know what. <laughs> but they forget that, actually. <laughs> so I have to just kind of gently remind them, and they all sit back down when I say, oh, that's okay. Do you talk to spirit? <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we do that, because that's far more acceptable. You know, being, being a medium, being clairvoyant, yeah, they can cope with that, you know. And then you go, right, well, okay. So this includes being a medium, talking to spirit, working with your ancestors, anything like that. It also includes going around the graveyard and digging up as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it does involve the creation of servitors, which you can do quite effectively in graveyards. It involves working with graveyard dirt, now, somebody asked me earlier, did I use stuff from home? Well, I do. I do because we've got some great graveyards where I live. We've got one that's called Pirate's Graveyard that has no pirates whatsoever in it. But one of the graves has a skull and crossbones on it, hence the name. And that's really old and that was completely ravaged by the French in the 17th century. So if there's any French here, thank you, because it's great graveyard dirt. Right, and the other one we've got is of all things, right, where I live, okay. Now, nobody else is going to have this, because this is just kind of a real Portland quirk, and I'm not responsible for this. We have a thing we call strangers that come to the island and settle, that live there, are known as Kimberlin, right? This is quite a derogatory word, because the islanders didn't like people settling there. I mean, it's a six by three island. Can you imagine if nobody else settled there, what the people would look like? Because <laughs> a lot of them do. <laughs> but they had a thing, because they didn't like settlers, we have a thing called Strangers Graveyard. Because these people were not allowed to be buried in our churchyards. <laughs> we would not have it. <laughs> They're not from here. <laughs> They've got their own graveyard. So, of course, you know, they've been so bad. This is kind of like real prejudice. So, it's real powerful graveyard, there, obviously. So, we have lots of really old and troubled graveyards at home. So, yes, if I want some real good, like, malevolent, build me own goo for dust and cause chaos, yeah, that's the place to go. 
Also got a graveyard, though, from the bottom of the Panari ruins in Romania. Because I figured that might be quite troubled, too. <laughs> so anything like that. So if you're working with anything that is to do with the remnants of death, you are practicing a form of necromancy. Okay, if you're working with anything to do with blood, and this includes, as Shay mentioned yesterday, ritual scarification and tattooing which is when all the Wiccans sit back down usually, because <laughs> they remember, oh yeah, we got those. So anything that is that is blood magic. But the most important thing is the magic we practice today has really ancient roots. I've got to go, because he's saying to me, minute, minute. <laughs> so I'm going to go, but you can come find me, you can talk to me, and anything else, okay? All right, thank you.